Hello, and welcome to Two Pews in a Pod. Join us as we explore faith in a modern world with the pastors of Evangelical Lutheran Church in Frederick, Maryland. Now here are your hosts, Pastor Paul Baglios and Pastor Ginger Bennett. Hello, I'm Ginger Bennett. And I'm Paul Baglios. And we'd like to welcome you again to Two Pews in a Pod, where we are on episode three out of six, uh, where we are discussing the topic of prayer. So today's topic um, is going to be liturgical prayer and sort of an entry into that because not everybody knows exactly what do we mean by liturgical prayer. Um, I think it's helpful to say liturgical prayer is prayer that happens in the context of a service generally, some sort of a, a liturgy or a um, an order of worship somehow where we join together. Now, you can do a prayer in a morning prayer by yourself, so liturgy does not have to be done by a community of people, although it can be. Um, So as we begin our topic today talking about different forms of liturgical prayer, I know we ended last time talking about this prayer that I love so much, and and you have found out the answer about (laughs) whether or not it was Martin Luther. So first, may we pray the prayer and and then talk a little bit more about it? Sure. It is this prayer that is familiar to many people. O God, you have called your servants to ventures of which we cannot see the ending by paths as yet untrodden through perils unknown. Give us faith to go out with good courage, not knowing where we go, but only that your hand is leading us and your love supporting us through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And this particular prayer Um, appears in the daily prayer liturgies in Lutheran usage. It is familiar and beloved in many Christian traditions. Mm -hmm. Um, I know many Lutherans who know this prayer by heart. Mm -hmm. It is not, in fact, written by Martin Luther. Uh, the The author of this prayer was a 20th century, um, teacher and pastor of the church. Um, Nevertheless, this is a prayer that resonates easily with Mm -hmm. Christian understanding of many different traditions. So the answer isn't always Martin Luther. No. Even though we might want... The answer is always Jesus. (laughs) Jesus, Jesus, um, right. But not necessarily always (laughs) Luther. Oh, Um, how funny. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so as we think about liturgical prayer, though, you mentioned that that is part of our differing prayer services. So, um, and, and I mentioned this last time, too, is that I really enjoy praying matins or morning prayer. And, and the church is actually set up, and, and you have there yep. our Evangelical Lutheran Worship or the ELW hymnal that we have, and it actually lists out several forms of liturgical prayer. So so talk to us a little bit about these um, liturgical daily prayers that we have in the Christian tradition. So this comes from medieval monastic practice mm-hmm. that monks living together in community uh, in a monastery would yeah. keep a prayer discipline as mm-hmm. part of their communal life together often referred to as the hours, mm-hmm. Praying and the as hours. many mm-hmm. as nine hours mm-hmm. in a 24-hour cycle would be right. marked by particular forms mm-hmm. of gathering for prayer, always including the recitation of psalms, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. could include the singing of hymns, mm-hmm. usually brief readings of scripture. Right. And these were often not services of Christian preaching, or right. sacramental services with Holy Communion, right. but ways that monks would mark the rhythm of a day mm-hmm. with a discipline of prayer. And for many Christians, Lutherans and otherwise, mm-hmm. certain elements of that have found their way mm-hmm. into wider practice far outside the monastery. And yes. so for a long time, any of the primary worship resources that Lutherans in the United States 
and in other countries of the mm -hmm. world have used, like the one that Pastor Bennett just mentioned, Evangelical Lutheran worship, the Cranberry Hymnal. Um, <laughs> not red. <laughs> that's right, not red. It's cranberry. Um, includes services of morning prayer or matins, mm -hmm. evening prayer or vespers, vespers, and nighttime prayer or close of the day prayer, also called Compline. Compline. Right. And I know you to be a person who will pray those daily prayers, mm -hmm. even if you are doing that just by yourself. Right. Well, you know what's interesting, and, and I'm not sure um, how many folks know this, but churches used to ring the bells of the church during these major prayer times, uh, morning prayer, usually an afternoon lunchtime prayer, and then the Vespers um, and Compline to invite people in to prayer. And um, often um, the afternoon lunchtime prayer would be to pray the Lord's Prayer. So they imagined um, the bells ringing and people being called in, whether they're standing out in their fields, tilling the ground, they might stop and, and just say um, the Lord's Prayer to recite that. And, you know, we talked last time about differing forms of prayer, just sort of feeling prayers versus praying prayers with words. But there's something important about liturgical prayer that I think invites us in in a completely different mm -hmm. way. And so we see this um, where people might have a handful of these prayers that we like to pray. Some folks do it to a rosary, um, mm -hmm. where and Lutherans uh, use these as well as other faith traditions. But to remind ourselves as we recite these prayers um, over and over, there's a way that we feel a special connection to God in these prayers so that it's not just saying these words, but it's actually... They become the prayer of our heart. And so I like to think of this farmer out in the field hearing that noontime bell and praying the Lord's Prayer, but as he's there looking at all of the amazing things God is doing, allowing crops to grow or or these sort of things, a very spiritual thing. Yeah, it, it has been much easier for Christian communities to keep practices mm -hmm. of daily prayer in more agrarian parish settings, right. let's say, where everyone's home and everyone's livelihood, <laughs> if they were um, especially related to agriculture, right. would all be occurring in the same geographic mm -hmm. space, perhaps where the church was at the center. Mm -hmm. That is not the case <laughs> for most people yeah. in modern society. Right. Um, but I, too, find it evocative to think about that sort of model. Right. And you've mentioned praying the Lord's Prayer, which yes. is uh, certainly the best-known, most widely recognized mm -hmm. shared prayer mm -hmm. um, among all Christians of varying traditions. Mm -hmm. And I'm aware that the Lord's Prayer even has a certain public familiarity. Oh, yes. You and I have both had experiences at funerals, mm -hmm. for example, yes, where the gathering of people might involve those who are practicing Christians and members of congregations and those who are not. Mm -hmm. And yet so often, if we invite that sort of gathering to, mm -hmm. to pray together the Lord's Prayer, many people are, even, are able to do yes. it, even if Christian mm -hmm. worship is not a regular part of their lives. Well, you know, one of the things I love about that prayer is often when we lead into it, you might hear us say, Lord, teach us to pray, mm -hmm. right? It is that invitation to God to teach us, just as the disciples asked Jesus mm -hmm. all of those years ago, teach us to pray, because there's a sense that we can become um, comfortable and become, uh, I don't know, so confident in our ability to pray that we forget that this is also asking God, how, how might we connect with you in this moment, in this space, but to do it as a liturgical group together coming in and saying, God, teach us to pray together. It's a beautiful thing. Well, and we could easily <clears throat> spend many episodes <laughs> in, in a series of this podcast 
devoted specifically to the Lord's Prayer. Yes, we could. Um, there are libraries of <laughs> reflections yes. that have been written about that particular prayer. But for this episode in this series, mm -hmm. you had prepared for us an outline of what we might do. And looking at that outline, mm -hmm. I wonder how often, and I'm thinking of a Sunday morning worship mm -hmm. service mm -hmm. here at Evangelical Lutheran Church, that would always include the reading of scripture and preaching. Right. It would always include Holy Communion. Right. But if you think about the order of worship, the mm -hmm. liturgy and all that it contains, a great deal of it is prayer. It really is, right. For even from the opening sentences, sort of like for you, getting up in the morning and, and basically saying, hello, God, good morning, God, um, that the very opening sentences that we might say at the beginning of a service in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, as we, many of us might cross ourselves, but it is invoking God's presence in this place and, and to be with us and to, to be a part of this. But even that in itself is a prayer. It is. And we move into other formal prayers mm -hmm. that you had listed out in the mm -hmm. outline you prepared for this series. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a very short prayer called the prayer of the day. Mm -hmm. Another word for that is collect. Right, the collect Because of the it's day. A, a short prayer that collects mm -hmm. the themes, the emphases, the points of focus and attention mm -hmm. of the given liturgical occasion into a short prayer. If we use a Kyrie, mm -hmm. yes. um, Lord in your mercy, repeated, um, that is a form of prayer. We have, of course, mm -hmm. prayers of intercession where mm -hmm. we lift up the needs of the congregation, the neighborhood, mm -hmm. the world, God's creation. Yes. All of the prayers that draw us into the sacrament of mm -hmm. the table, mm -hmm. um, many of them fixed and repeated, mm -hmm. um, some of them... Um, more, this is our prayer this week. Um, all right. of it is prayer. Mm -hmm. And and of course, prayer of confession, uh, another important prayer that might be prayed one-on-one -on -one with yourself and a pastor or a priest, as well as there are services in our uh, worship literature for communal services that are around confession and forgiveness and then it can also be this simple prayer and uh, reminder of God's forgiveness that happen in the middle of a traditional worship mm -hmm. service. So lots of differing ways that we are called in and invited into prayer um, within the context of a service. And, and some churches, and we have this um, not as part of our liturgy right now, but we often invite folks for healing prayers uh, before or mm -hmm. after a worship service where um, someone needs uh, prayer for a reason, uh, medical or emotional or what have you, and we will gather with them often at a kneeler or at the altar to pray. There's a, <clears throat> I think there's an important point that's helpful for Christians to bear, that as God's people in Christ... We are always praying with the church, mm -hmm. even right. when we are completely by ourselves. Right. And one of the ways that that becomes obvious, again, is in the words of the Lord's Prayer. Right. We always, even if I'm entirely by myself, I pray, our Father. Right. Not my Father. <laughs> our Father. We have to share. <laughs> well, and... Prayer in the context of a larger gathering of mm -hmm. the Christian community, I think, becomes the school, the, mm -hmm. uh, the incubator for yeah. our individual prayer understandings and mm -hmm. prayer practices. As you were just saying, um, I think of occasions we have in the back of the sanctuary here right. at Evangelical Lutheran Church, we have recently again set up a particular kneeler and mm -hmm. that's been a nice place when we know that somebody in the community is in a particular need mm -hmm. for the prayer of others. Mm -hmm. We invite them to go back 
to kneel at that kneeler and mm-hmm. gather however many members of the community yeah. may be around them. Certainly they can pray on their own sure. and probably do. But there is something about knowing that our prayers are joining the prayers mm-hmm. of others yeah. or that others are praying on our behalf. Mm-hmm. You mentioned in the previous episode um, times that somebody will say, would you pray for me? Mm. Or I'm yeah. praying for you. Right. Um, I have often found that not only comforting, but I think it changes my experience when people have said, we're praying for you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it invites us into uh, a space where... Um, I'm not just thinking about my own needs and what what I want or what I uh, need in my own life, but I I put myself in the place of this person and maybe the people in their world that are there holding them up. And I often um, appreciate that prayer to not just pray for the one person in need in that moment, but if it's a medical condition, praying for the doctors and the nurses and the staff that is holding them and caring for them, praying for those family members who are, um, they're holding vigil with them. Uh, and, and, you know, there are definitely people all around us that are affected by our own, um, situations in life. And so, um, to keep all of that in prayer is a is a lovely thing, and and to do it back in that space, I think, in our church, is a wonderful place. Um, there's a sense of ambiance about it to mm-hmm. be in this holy space, um, and then to, where prayer so routinely happens, right? Yeah. And and often we will put hands on someone, and we have also a practice of anointing someone with oil during those prayers at times, so. Adding in all of those things, that holy connection as a community joining in prayer, I think is a beautiful, um, wonderful way to to connect with God, but also to connect with one another. And I want, this is jumping track <laughs> a little bit, um, but something you were saying before. So especially for members of Evangelical Lutheran Church who are listening to this episode or for other Christians who may belong to congregations that use this cranberry book <laughs> called Evangelical Lutheran Worship, I'm, I wonder if people have ever taken the time to thumb through right. um, all of the prayers, say, mm-hmm. within the first hundred pages, mm. and to see the different occasions, contexts, mm-hmm. needs that there are prayers already prepared mm-hmm. in this book. Mm-hmm. And of course, it, it, there's infinite library of resources mm-hmm. with other prayer. On the bookshelves behind me, I've got many books mm-hmm. that are collections of prayers. One that has been again and again over my life important to me have been the daily texts of the Moravian Church. Oh, uh-huh. I grew up in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, which is um, the global headquarters of the <laughs> Moravian Church. And I didn't realize that. Year upon year upon year upon year for decades, my mother would always make sure that I had a copy of each year's edition of, of the, the Moravian Daily Texts, Very which nice. include um, a prayer for each day, a collect mm-hmm. for each day. And one of the happy things is that our bishop, Bishop Mm -hmm. Bill Goal of the Delaware, (laughs) Maryland Synod, provides as a gift to all rostered ministry leaders of the Synod a copy of the Moravian Daily Texts. He's done a couple different ones, but that one's been the last couple years, and it's really lovely to, to have that. And we have often in our home kept that at a place that... um, especially if we're going to be gathering with family or friends, Mm -hmm. and we know we want to have at least a brief pause Mm -hmm. of prayer Mm -hmm. in that time together, we've often pulled that and opened to the prayer for the date in which we are gathered. It also has a scripture reading and a couple lines from a hymn that, Mm -hmm. you know, something we've been doing at our church, uh, we did 
for several weeks in November as we prepared for Thanksgiving, as we were thinking about those who uh, experience hunger, is we've taken a mm-hmm. line of, of hymnody, right, a line out of a hymn, and we have prayed that together as a prayer. And so I love how in that resource you're talking about, there is often a line or two of him that serves also as a prayer. Well, in many of the hymns, perhaps we could just say all of the hymns, but certainly <laughs> many of them, mm-hmm. the words of the hymns are beautiful yes. prayers. Mm-hmm. And I, in my own fit and start episodic, undisciplined discipline <laughs> of prayer, often at different times in my life, I have kept a practice of praying one of the hymns that I have sung in worship with a congregation mm-hmm. the previous Sunday. Mm-hmm. Um, That's a nice thing. It's it's wonderful how those prayers or those songs can um, come into our our heart or our mind at a random time and remind us of God's love. And I'm thinking of watching my own daughter, who's 14. We were at the at home uh, not long ago, and she started humming a song from church on Sunday that was speaking to her in that moment. And I said, what are you singing, sweetie? And she said, oh, I didn't even think about it. It was what we used for the gospel acclamation on oh. Sunday. you know. And, but it's that wonderful reality that it it comforts us, and, and it's something that is taken from often a part of our worship service that comforts us long after the service is over. Well, and that's a, I'm going to suggest that's a nice place to end this episode. (laughs) Um, Thinking about the question with which we began, it is the prayer of the church Mm. that teaches Christians how to pray. Yeah, I think that's beautiful. I'm Paul Baglios. And I'm Ginger Bennett. And thank you again for joining us in this episode of our podcast, Two Pews in a Pod. This has been Two Pews in a Pod, a podcast led by the pastors of Evangelical Lutheran Church in Frederick, Maryland. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time.